absolutely delighted um, to introduce today uh, Professor Susan Scarrow. Uh, Susan is Moore's Professor of Political Science at the University of Houston. And Susan is um, without doubt one of the major political party scholars of the last the last decades. I can say that um, Susan, along with Peter Mayer, are singularly responsible for getting me interested in political party members. So you, you, you've got to answer for it. Um, uh, Susan's research focus is mainly on the organization and development of political parties, She's worked on um, party finance, also on direct democracy. She's also the co-organizer of the political party database project with Thomas Boguntka and Paul Webb. And I'm going to stick a link to that in the chat uh, while, while Susan's talking, so you can go and check that out. It's an absolutely wonderful resource and there's some great, um, some, some great publications already come out of that. It would take up way too much of our time for me to do a long list of Susan's publications, um, but she's written extensively in, in both major journals and with major book presses on political parties. I can recommend in particular this book, um, which is so important that I keep it at home rather than in the office, Beyond Party Members, uh, which was published with Oxford in 2014. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Susan. And thanks again, Susan, for, for joining us. I know it's your evening there. We've had the ECPR conference this week. The last thing you feel like probably is another is another presentation, but we're really grateful that, that you've made the time to come and talk to us. Thank you, Duncan. No, this is great to be here. And I'm saying I've never been to Australia, so this constitutes my first visit to Australia. I don't think it's uh, uh, quite the visit I had in mind. Um, so uh, I will hope to uh, have another visit and see your university uh, in, in person. Uh, but for now, it's great to be here. I think you can see my slides now. Is that correct? Someone type in the chat if you can't see it. Yeah, that's all. It looks OK, you got, you got it. OK, good. Um, so when when I set this up, uh, we we talked about what what the title of or what the t talk should be about, and uh, I decided to present a generalist talk on the study of party membership rather than something narrower, such as a conference paper. Uh, and my aim today is to convince you that the study of party membership remains important, and that developments in this area shed light on questions related to political participation, representation, elections, and therefore this is relevant for many fields of political science. And as Duncan says, I've written several books on this topic, so it's I'm certainly uh, self-interested in making this argument, um, but it's a subfield and I don't expect everybody who's at this talk or politely at this talk to come thinking that they have always wanted to know more about party membership. So I think it deserves an introduction. And by way of introduction and perhaps encouragement to students in the audience, let me say that my own interest in studying party members began in graduate school. I was studying elections and parliamentary democracies. I was studying first in Germany and then in the UK. And while I was there, I saw election campaigns. And in particular, I started seeing how local parties were campaigning and what the party members were doing. And it looked different. It looked different from what I knew in the United States. It also, the countries looked different from each other. And I became fascinated with this aspect of what parties were doing. Uh, and started uh, looking into it more. And so that uh, became part of my dissertation research. And then it turned out that I was not the only one who was becoming interested in the subject at this time, which was good for me because there was much uh, conferences to go to and people to meet and people to run ideas past. And in fact, the 1990s saw a big burst of scholarship on party organization and party membership. Uh, a subject that had not received a lot of attention in the 1970s and 1980s. And some of the milestone studies were Pat Said and Paul Whiteley's surveys of British party members. Uh, they succeeded in convincing 
uh, parties to share their lists, their contact lists, and use that as the basis for uh, surveying party members. This was a novelty and encouraged other parties and other scholars to do the same. So we wound up with party member surveys in Ireland, Canada, Germany, Denmark, Belgium, other countries, and they go on until today. Uh, and partly uh, because scholars can point to other uh, studies and convince uh, party, uh, party organizations that they shouldn't be scared to do this and that they might learn something themselves that they want to do. Uh, so that had not always been the case. And in the 1990s, there was also the Katz Mayer Handbook, uh, as, as it's known, party organizations. Uh, the uh, a very thick book, if you've seen it in the library or on anybody's shelf, uh, which you can now get, it's all digitized. Uh, but this was a collaborative data collection that focused on parties in 11 countries uh, and that focused on cross-national comparative studies of aspects of party organization that you could quantify or easily summarize uh, and thus encouraging people to do comparative studies of party organizations. So this kind of these kind of efforts have stimulated interest in party members. It goes on till today. Uh, one of the places if you're interested in this that you can find data sources and links to what's out there is something called the MAP Project, a website uh, run by Emily van Ott and some others uh, that uh, brings together numbers on of political party members and also links to these surveys. So there's a lot of research on this, but paradoxically, as the scrutiny of party members grew, the object of our sub uh, the object of our studies seemed to shrink. Uh, the prevailing diagnosis uh, uh, is a much cited is in a much cited article is titled "Going, Going, Gone," with a question mark. But the question mark often gets forgotten, and that that seems to be uh, the message many people have gotten about party membership. The other message people have gotten is not only is there a decline, but this decline is a symptom of democratic malaise. So even people who aren't particularly interested in party membership will cite this as a kind of canary in the in the coal mine a phenomenon. Party membership is shrinking, and that is one of the symptoms of what's wrong with democracies today. So my argument today is that it's worth looking more closely at the numbers and at the stories behind the numbers to try to understand what's happening. Not only how much change is there, but also what this may mean for how parties perform democratic linkage. Some of the changes we see may be about malaise, but not all of them are. And indeed, some of the ongoing changes may have positive aspects. So why is anyone still studying party members? Let me give you uh, four answers today uh, in my talk. Uh, whoops. First, parties still organize as membership-based organizations. Second, the membership numbers don't tell the whole story. The decline in party membership is real, but perhaps it's not as dramatic as it's sometimes portrayed. Third, party members play increasingly important roles in parties and fourth, how parties respond to this decline is also important and can affect representation. So I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk elaborating on these points. Uh, but before that, let me make a brief detour uh, to uh, tell you about the political party database. I'm going to be taking data from that uh, throughout the talk to illustrate the argument. So let me just briefly introduce uh, this resource. The PPDB, as it's called, uh, you can see its website here, uh, and hopefully you can see the address, but uh, that's Duncan's put that in the chat. Uh, it's a data collection project, uh, a collaborative, a cooperative uh, 
project that relies on country experts to provide information about political parties. And it's a, an official story data collection. Uh, in other words, it's based on what parties say about themselves. For instance, say it in their statutes or put it on their web pages or in reports that they submit, such as financial reports. So experts code the data based on those sources, but we distinguish this from an expert judgment data source like VDEM or VParty, and in fact, it probably complements the expert judgment. So, for example, one set of questions would ask about the content of political parties' web pages. Um, do they have a donate now button? Do they have a, a, a members only section? Can you use the web page to join uh, the party? So uh, experts are looking at this, but they're using what the, what the documentary evidence says. The first round of the project uh, was collected for 2010 to 2014. It covers uh, mostly European parliamentary democracies, but we also expanded to some non-European parliamentary democracies. You can see Australia there uh, with Annika Gauja uh, contributing. Uh, and we also included a few presidential democracies in uh, Mexico and Latin America to uh, see if our questions traveled. Could did they make sense what we were asking about political parties in other environments? And indeed they did. So we expanded uh, round two, uh, which covers 2017 to 2020. And you can see from the slide, we're uh, now double the number of countries and more than double the number of parties that are covered. Uh, and uh, we're especially pleased that this includes uh, many uh, parties and countries in Africa. So round one is available. Uh, if you go to the website there, you can find how to download the data. Round two should be available uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and we really encourage people to poke around to the data and use it. Uh, that's what it's there for. This is a source that gives an up-to-date and granular sense of how parties organize, at least in a formal sense. And certainly the official story is not the whole story, but we contend that it is a good starting point. So that ends the detour. Uh, let me get back to my to my story now, uh, my answering the question of why study party members if party membership numbers have been declining so much over the past two decades. So the first answer is that this is how parties organize. It's how parties still organized whether we look at the party statutes or whether we look at how citizens relate to parties. Uh, if you look at party statutes, uh, you can see, as we do from the PPDB, uh, you can see do party statutes recognize membership in a formal way? Do they recognize it uh, with procedural ways, such as you have to pay dues in order to uh, joined, and also do they recognize it in the way they structure their formal decision-making bodies, such as do they have party conferences to which delegates or party members uh, are invited? And what you see here in this slide is, yeah, they all organize this way. I mean, it's just almost all of them maintain individual membership and in, that recognize it in their statutes. Almost all of them have regular party conferences and almost all of them set uh, local do, uh, dues rates, either at the national parties or the local. So it's not uh, just anybody can say they're a party member, but there's some procedure involved. So in this sense, uh, parties are still membership bodies. Also in the sense of if you ask people, are you a party member, they answer you and they tell you yes or no. Uh, and the, the question seems to make sense, although it also seems to make sense in uh, different ways uh, to different people, perhaps based on what they see around them of what does it mean to be a party member. Uh, and this is uh, most evident if you look at the, the bottom of uh, the, the bars here is the United States, uh, which seems to have the highest number of respondents say they're party members, whether active or inactive. And we know that parties in the United States are not these subscriber democracy parties that uh, you see in more many parliamentary democracies. So we know that party membership actually means something rather different and may just mean that people vote in 
party primaries. Uh, and so they are active in that sense that they vote, uh, but may not mean the same as if you ask someone in Germany or the UK or Australia, are you a party member? They may mean something very different by this. So these kind of numbers look a little suspect and may mean different things if they go up or down. But on the other hand, what I want you to take away from this slide is that there are a lot of countries, seen a, webinar, so a, a lot of countries in which uh, a lot of people, uh, five to ten percent or fifteen percent of the population, will say, uh, "Yes, I'm a party member." So the concept of party membership seems to mean a lot. Here we have another set of uh, mostly parliamentary democracies, European parliamentary democracies here from the European Social Survey. Uh, and so it might be people thinking in a more similar way about what is party membership. And here we get figures that perhaps look more like uh, party member scholars would, would expect now, that it's sort of two to two to five percent, depending whether you say, is this two to five percent of the whole electorate or is it two to five percent of a party's voters join as uh, party members. And if you take the, the V of the voters as the denominator, you see a slightly higher um, proportion, but still quite low. I mean, and that's uh, strikingly low and strikingly low if you look at the bottom set of bars for the United Kingdom. Uh, this is particularly surprising given that a lot of those scholarship on political parties has been written about parties in the UK. So you can see they're a little bit of an anomaly of having particularly low membership. So hold that in mind as we go on to the next section. Um, but to just to conclude, there is something about the concept of membership that seems to be important to the parties and, and, and citizens recognize it. So even if they're not a lot of party members, uh, party membership is perhaps not obsolete. So the second answer to my question is another reason to pay attention is because membership numbers don't tell the whole story, uh, in part because we have rather imperfect data. So if you look at this decline, uh, you may want to be a little skeptical about the decline because the historical numbers are often reporting things that are much different than contemporary numbers. Uh, before the 1970s or 1980s even, very few parties had central membership registries. Their membership number estimates were based on reports from local parties. Local parties had reasons to exaggerate uh, even or even requirements to overstate their memberships. In contrast, contemporary parties have national membership data and the databases, and the quality of the data is much higher. So the national party knows where you live, uh, in which constituency you live, uh, has an email address for you, can contact you. Um, so these are real people, not just sort of fictional people for whom the party, the, the local party, is paying an affiliation fee. So some of the apparent decline everywhere is certainly due to improved measurement data. Let me then illustrate this. I said I was going to come back to the UK and illustrate this with uh, what it looks like for the UK parties, because it's particularly striking here. Uh, and it's often cited case of really drastic membership decline. And you look at the the Conservative Party for the 1950s with 2.5 million members. Wow. And then it's just plunged and it's now uh, down to about 200,000 or less and seems like a huge drop. But you have to remember that the Conservative Party didn't have national membership in the 50s. It didn't even have requirements that local parties should collect dues from members. It didn't even collect this data very often. So the data reflect someone in central office, someone may, made an estimate, and these are all estimates, and said, oh, I think we have 2.5 million members. Nice round figure. Um, certainly the conservative, local conservative parties in the 50s were more active than they became later on. So there was certainly some decline, but 2.5 million was a fictional number. And you can see there are not many data points on that line, uh, but they're all pretty fictional up until 
the 1990s when you see that steep drop um, uh, right here, you see this, this drop. Um, and what happens then is they get a national membership register and they ask local parties and then the local parties uh, send them the names and then the individuals have to join themselves and keep paying dues every year to be part of, of the national membership database. So what you see is uh, administrative change. It's not really a change in how many people are active in that party or members of that party. It's just purely how many people uh, are, are paying dues and now they know. Similarly with the Labour Party, you can see uh, uh, a similar basis of that uh, right between 1978 and 1981. And those of you who know your political history know that the Labour Party political fortunes went down. And this was the election of Margaret Thatcher uh, and her, her overwhelming uh, victory in 1979. So it's easy to look at that decline and say, oh, that's because the Labour Party was unpopular. But in fact, what happened was the Labour Party changed its rules uh, for local constituency parties. Up until that time, every party had to affiliate or pay dues for a minimum of 1,000 members. And then they changed it to a minimum of 200 members, and then the next year dropped it all together. There was no minimum. So probably what's going on is there was a steep decline, perhaps reflecting some kind of long-term decline, or perhaps some of those parties had never had a thousand members ever. Um, in other words, we look at this data, and, and political scientists love quantitative data, and we can we can line it up, say, with public opinion or with voting data, and look at the difference between these numbers and the vote share for the party. But if the party data isn't very accurate, that may be telling us the wrong story. Uh, we may draw conclusions that aren't really supported by this data. And that is probably true in a lot of countries uh, because uh, there was measurement error in the past and all of it worked in a way that would inflate membership. So there has been clear downward trend in membership. I don't want to say there hasn't been, but exactly how big that decline is, we don't really know because we don't really know how many party members parties used to have. Moreover, we know that sometimes trends go up. They don't always go down. Uh, and here's an example again from the UK of after the 2014 election, there was a big jump in the Labour Party membership. Uh, and uh, that had to do with the party holding leadership elections, uh, gave uh, supporters incentives to join the party, uh, but also the party was out trying to recruit people. Um, it was not the only party that in the UK that added members after uh, the 2014 election in a more polarized political environment in the UK, a party membership did go up. So another reason to keep studying party membership is because uh, party membership numbers tell a story that is much more interesting uh, than linear decline. There's more to it. Uh, and among other things, we wanna know why and when some parties can buck this downward trend uh, and under what are the circumstances that attract people back to political parties. So maybe the sky is falling, but we should be a little skeptical about the numbers. And we should go further than just looking at the numbers and saying, how might the changes matter? Okay, so point three, party members still or increasingly play important roles in parties. They remain an important source of candidates and they're particularly important for local government elections, but they also have in many parties a direct role in decision-making by way of ballots of members. Uh, there has been a trend in the past two decades for parties to give members more direct say in important party decisions 
Uh, and this includes balloting, whether whether it's by postal ballot or internet ballot or uh, balloting in in meetings. Uh, sometimes uh, par parties use ballots to select a party leader. Sometimes they're used for selecting candidates. Some parties have even held referendums on policy issues, uh, including uh, who should you go into coalition with. So. Party members can have a decisive uh, impact uh, on some party decisions, uh, meaning that party leaders need to at least try to persuade the party members to go along with them uh, and uh, maybe pay attention when they don't want to go along. And let me give an illustration of this trend. We don't have uh, longitudinal data, so I can't tell you for sure how this has changed, but if you look at uh, particularly parliamentary democracies in the 1990s, uh, we do have studies that show that things such as member ballots in leadership selection were very rare. Uh, and now you can see, or perhaps you can see, I hope you can see, that over 40 percent of the parties in PPD round two, for which we got answers on this question, over 40% of them allow for membership ballots. Um, moreover, um, and some people have said, well, these are perhaps just plebiscites in the kind of bad sense of the word and that they're just votes, coronation votes or vote for acclamation that are perhaps only used when leaders know what the outcome is going to be. So perhaps this is uh, pseudo democratization, but it's not really very important for the outcomes. But in fact, in some other research I've I'm, I'm been doing with my uh, co authors, Thomas Baguntka and Paul Webb, we've been looking at when leadership ballots are used, uh, what's the margin of victory? How contested are they? And in fact, what we found is that they tend to be more contested than when parties use, for instance, party conferences to select their leaders. So there does seem to be real choice going on, and perhaps not always, but certainly at least as often as when uh, party members were not so directly included in the choice. So if party members get a say, then it matters who joins the political parties. Uh, it also matters for representation. Uh, we'd like to know, are their attitudes reflective of other party supporters? Uh, are they demographically representative of other party supporters? If not, there are uh, possibilities for distorted representation or for tensions between party leaders who get torn between serving party activists and party voters. So to my final argument about why it's important to keep studying party members uh, is because parties are adapting to these uh, declining numbers and how they adapt may precisely affect representation by affecting who joins and what kind of uh, powers do those members have. So one way that parties have adopted, adapted to this is uh, to increase the benefits. I've already uh, described above this increase in participatory rights, and we see that in many parties that it is adapted, uh, adopted partly in response to declining members. It's sometimes linked uh, in the rhetoric about why are we doing this as we want to re revitalize our party and, and, and show how, our, how responsive the leaders are. Uh, because this will this will be rewarded by our supporters. Uh, another response is to reduce the cost for joining. Let's make it easy to join. Let's not make party membership something that's really hard to acquire, but we're going to make it easy for anybody who wants us wants to join us to join. We don't want to seem like we're in smoky back rooms, stuffy, and it's only men who go and talk politics. We want to be open for everybody. Uh, and and we want youth to join. And where do the youth live? They live on the web. So let's make it easy to join. And so we looked at how easy was it to join parties. And what we found is that over 40% allow people to join the party 
uh, fully online. If you spontaneously decide you you hear some podcast and say, I have to make a difference. I'm going to go join the party tonight. I'm at my computer. I want to join it right now. 45% uh, of the parties let you do that immediately. Any time of day or night, you can join your party. Uh, you don't have to go find where your party is, fill out a form, mail in something, have an interview. You just join right now. Another 25% let you start the process online. You may still have to fill out forms, but at least you can download the form uh, and get started on the process when you're still eager. And uh, over 80% have no probationary period. You join, you're joining. We're not gonna wait and see if you're really a good member. You just join now and you're part of our party. So parties are uh, trying to make it easier to join. Uh, they are also introducing some other reforms, uh, a sort of more radical version of reducing the costs of uh, joining is uh, what I have in uh, called the multi-speed membership option. Uh, this was a part of, part of uh, my last book on this topic uh, was the idea of the multi-speed party. And the multi-speed party is one in which parties are getting away from the binary idea of membership. The only way to connect with supporters is by having them become formal members. Instead, what you see, parties are looking beyond that, like many organizations nowadays. Uh, they want to connect with you. They want, your, they want your email address so they can send you information, so they can try to mobilize you and get you to uh, go to a rally, uh, get you to share a story uh, with your Facebook friends, get you to follow them on Twitter, get you to spread their message uh, and be available perhaps if volunteers are needed or donors are needed. For all of that, you don't need to be a traditional member. And so parties are creating new ways of affiliating, um, including um, registered supporters. You don't like party membership, you're a little suspicious of party members, just register your support, just become a party friend. Uh, it's free, you can join us that way. Or thinking about party membership, not sure, how about a trial membership? You can join for one euro or one pound or one dollar, we'll just let you try it out. Uh, if you're a little, we have to get over the threshold. Um, some parties are creating cyber members. You don't have to actually go to a meeting, a real meeting. And this was before the pandemic, uh, before we were all virtual, there were uh, parties having cyber member branches. So you didn't have to go to an actual branch. In the PPDB, we see uh, again, over 40% of the parties are offering this party friend option in addition to party membership. Uh, again, I remember that slide from the beginning where almost 95% or more offer party membership. But in addition to that, about half of them offer the party friend option. But they are still differentiating between them because most parties aren't giving the party friends a vote. Few are, but most are not giving them the most privileged uh, benefit of membership, which would be to help select the leader. So parties are changing. They're making it easier to join. They're giving you more if you join. And specifically, they're giving you political benefits. Um, how does this matter? How is this changing? Um, who, who joins parties? Does it change? Do we see any uh, changes because of these changes in the parties. Uh, and we can think about this in, in two ways, in both uh, uh, demographic representation and the, and the more uh, substantive representation of political preferences. Uh, and demographically, we know that party members have always been rather unrepresentative of the electorate at large. They've been older, uh, it's much more likely to join a party if uh, men are much more likely to women to join parties. Uh, party members have tended to have higher education levels than other voters for the same party. Uh, and they tend to come from distinct uh, distinct uh, social groups. Uh, so trade unions on the left or uh, more religious 
uh, religiously observant uh, for some Christian Democratic parties, for instance. They also tend to be somewhat different than party voters ideologically, not as much as is sometimes positive, but you can see some distinct differences between party members and uh, uh, party voters and for voters for the same party. So what do we see? Uh, this comes from uh, an, a research I conducted with Susan Achuri, Karina Kosiara peterson and Emily Van Ott, uh, which we use data on party rules from the PPDB. And we use data on, matched it with data on individual members from the European Social Survey and asked, did we see a relationship between the kind of benefits that parties offered and who chose to join. And here we're looking at political benefits such as uh, can you vote for candidates? Can you vote for leaders? Can you, are there referendums? So we were looking at these political benefits uh, and, and looking at how it might affect who joins. And what you see here and in the next slide is that as the benefits increase, in some ways, the party members are looking more like the party voters. So the ideological difference between party members and party voters is decreasing here. Uh, here we see that women are also becoming as likely as men to join political parties. On the other hand, uh, the age is still increasing, so it doesn't seem to be uh, having an uh, evening out effect on, on age. Um, but at least in some ways, the change in benefits seems to correspond to party members. Uh, even if it's a shrinking party membership, uh, it's a membership that may look a little more like the party's other supporters, their voters. Uh, and that um, could actually be a positive thing for parties. So I, again, I started out by saying that not all decline may be bad, that there could be positive changes in parties. We shouldn't think of it only in terms of democratic malaise. Okay, so I'm drawing close to the end here. Uh, let me just wrap up with a kind of what next. Uh, I know we have some students in the audience. So again, I'm trying to uh, lure you into looking for some research topics in this area. Um, and here I would think of, you know, two broad categories of research, the members as dependent variables and the members as independent variables. So on the dependent variable side is the one that has been most studied. Who joins, who gets active, how and why does it vary? And more recently, does online participation change things? Uh, whether change who chooses to join or change what people do once they're in a party. There's still some interesting things to research here, but I would argue that it's members as independent variables that has the most scope for new research because it's received the least amount of attention. Um, for instance, we still want to know what about the role of members in affecting electoral outcomes. Uh, we have some data on that, but not from a lot of countries, uh, and there's still more to be said there. What about if party members are involved in leadership selection? How does that change? Who stands for party leader? How long party leaders hold their office? Does it affect things? Uh, we see these new rights. What are, what are the consequences for political outcomes? Uh, at the party system level, uh, one of the concepts that's much talked about now is party system institutionalization. How do parties' organizational efforts, and specifically their efforts to organize supporters as members, how does that affect institutionalization? Does it contribute to uh, polarization or does it contribute to stabilization? Uh, and I'll you know remind you of that first one of those first slides that showed, party uh, countries that think of themselves or where, where people think of themselves as party members, uh, some of the highest countries were not the most democratic. So it's not clear that having a lot of members is actually going to contribute to, to some kind of stability. It might contribute to polarization and instability. And finally, what about attitudes, uh, particularly 
uh, looking at party members as part of social networks. How do they affect the other people they know? Do they make them feel more positive about democracy or more likely to vote, more likely to vote for any party? Um, how, do, how does the presence of some citizens who identify and perhaps talk about their partisanship, how does that affect others? More generally, I might say that this second set of questions is, why would membership decline matter anyway? And here I think uh, we don't really have very good answers. Uh, some people have said it's very important that membership is declining and that this may be um, bad for democracy, but they generally tend to be thinking of it as it's a symptom of something that's bad, not that the lack of party members, uh, or not to talk about what are we gonna lose that we don't have those party members. Uh, is it a is it a bad cycle, a bad spiral that if we don't have party members, this is going to make parties perform worse? Or if they weren't important anyway, maybe it doesn't really matter. Uh, so I think those kind of questions still need to be answered uh, and there's still interesting research to be done uh, in this area. So that's my, uh, my uh, points for today. I hope I've uh, convinced you that party members still may, and in many cases do play an important role, uh, which makes it important to understand who is choosing to participate in them. I can't say that there's a guarantee that this field will still be worth studying in half a century. Maybe party membership will completely disappear. Uh, but for the moment, it remains important for understanding how representation works in many countries. So thank you.